picked, by the way, because I live, I'm the journalist who lives nearest to Emily in Dublin. <laughs> We're about a mile apart up, up the road on the, on the north side of Dublin. Um, Emily is probably one of Ireland's most distinguished ever journalists, so it's, it's a great sense of pride amongst, the, uh, amongst people here in Ireland when she took up the office uh, of European Ombudsman. She'd been Ombudsman here for the previous number of years after her, her career in, in journalism. Obviously, Times have changed now, I suppose, from dealing with the Ombudsman's office here in journalism in Dublin, where you tended to deal with a lot of very specific complaints that came in from members of the public. But now, interestingly enough, your point is that you, you going, not only are you going pan-European, but you also get a number of complaints, indeed, from tech firms themselves. So how, how does that work in terms of, like, your, your workload now? Is it actually... Uh, dealing with major international firms who are, who are upset about the manner in which EU processes are operating, or does it tend to be individual people who come forward to you, and particularly related to the tech industry? Well, it's both. I suppose the, the biggest difference between the uh, working as a national ombudsman, which I did here for, for 10 years, and also information commissioner dealing with freedom of information or transparency complaints, and being an ombudsman in, in Europe, uh, I suppose to some degree it's, it's the nature of the complaints that you get because the vast majority of complaints that you get as a national ombudsman are usually about, you know, really the real stuff of people's lives, whether it's social protection, health, education, all of that. And they are still um, uh, the mainstay of the national ombudsman's role. But as European ombudsman, I deal with complaints that are against the European institutions, bodies and agencies. I mean, I suppose primarily the European Commission, which is the big beast in the jungle, but also lots of the, the regulatory agencies, the chemicals agency, the medicines agency, and so on. Uh, I also deal with complaints against uh, the council. So anybody who is resident in, uh, in Europe or has business in Europe or is a citizen of, of the European Union can come and complain to me. Um, so typically you might get complaints from companies who have contracts with the commissioner with an agency, something's gone wrong, they come to me and see if I can sort it out. You get a lot of um, complaints from civil society, NGO, Transparency International, for example, Corporate Europe Observatory, who might be seeking records on the transparency regulation um, and have been denied them, and they come to me. In relation to some of the tech companies, some of the big companies that come to me, very often they come to me if they were in the middle, uh, if they were being investigated um, by the uh, Competition Commission, if there was an antitrust case or whatever, if they were accused of being sort of um, uh, playing fast and loose with the rules that govern competition in Europe. And it's not that I deal with the substance of the actual um, complaints that have been made against them or the allegations that have been made against them. What I would deal with is the process. So, for example, when Intel was being investigated some years ago, uh, it made a complaint in relation to the fact that the Commission had held a meeting with its rival company, with Dell, and details of that meeting hadn't been minuted. Uh, so I looked into that, made a recommendation, and the Commission changed its process. We also got a complaint from another uh, tech company in relation to an email that it should have been, um, that was given to, I think, a, a, a rival or, or competitor uh, that they hadn't seen and that they had a right to see. So those are the sort of, uh, sort of on the margins process pieces that I deal with, but which still can be very important to them when, they're, when, the, when the case is being, uh, is being examined. And a, a big issue for you then is, is transparency of that process. The, the safe harbor ECG, ECJ ruling recently, potentially a game changer, but it probably sent out a, a big message to United States tech companies in particular that, that Europe is a major player here. Yeah. How is that going to change the, the yeah, well, language? I, I, I think in, in the last few years, I think the global tech industry, and I suppose particularly the US tech industry, has woken up to the power of, of the European Union uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, it's a huge market, 500 million people. It's still largely untapped in a lot of ways in relation to the digital economy and so on. And also because um, the Commission uh, and the ECJ effectively regulate the industries. The, the Commission by making proposals in relation to legislation that controls the tech industry. And also the ECJ that makes decisions in relation to whether that legislation has been uh, abided by or not. So when the ECJ ruled on the Safe Harbour Agreement, um, a complaint which actually began with the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, this was a complaint um, from uh, an individual who said that he claimed that his, the contents of his Facebook um, book or his Facebook um, site were being illegally sent to 
the servers of uh, the US servers of, 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 of Facebook. So the Data Protection Commissioner didn't deal with it for, for, for a number of reasons, and eventually the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, um, dealt with it. And it ruled essentially that the safe harbor agreement, which was the way in which um, US and other companies were able to transfer data from their European sites onto their servers in the US, that basically the, that the safe harbor agreement was not a sufficient guarantor of the level of data protection that European citizens get under our data protection law in, in, the, um, uh, in the EU. And the basis of that was basically that, that some of the um, US legislation, like the Patriot Act and other pieces of legislation that have come in post 9-11, uh, I mean, basically, those legislation which allowed um, the government agencies and so on to go in and essentially take people's data or look at people's data, um, that that trumped uh, the privacy rights of individuals. Um, and so, in that sense, it's back to square one. So, there are a lot of people scrabbling around now in Europe and the US to try and put together uh, Safe Harbor 2. But there was another very important uh, ECJ ruling uh, a couple of years ago, and this is, this is controversial, controversial on both sides of the Atlantic, and this concerns the right to be forgotten. Uh, and again, the ECJ ruled that, um, and this came from, I think, originally a Spanish gentleman who back in the 90s had had a, a tax difficulty, and this had been written about in local Spanish newspapers. Uh, but now when anybody went onto Google or any website, they could find a link to his... Um, unhappiness uh, uh, from, the, from the 90s, and he ruled that that simply, he decided that that wasn't fair, and the ECJ uh, agreed with him. So now when you Google, you see very often at the end of the website search, it says, well, certain links might not be here on account of EU data protection rulings. So that's why, that's another reason why the EU is, is, is very important. And also the priority of the commission, one of the, the main priorities of, of the commission, which is in a sense the, the government, if you like, uh, the senior admin, the main administrative body or lawmaking body of the, um, of the EU or law proposing body of the EU, the current commission, which runs until 2019, it has made the creation of a digital single economy a key priority. And so it's pushing ahead with things such as the, the net neutrality um, uh, regulation, which was just passed into law just last week. Um, data protection, they're, they're moving to update the data protection law, which was created in 1995. Um, and they're also basically trying to steer the European economy and the European tech economy uh, in a manner where it can um, uh, at least attempt to match the dominance of the US. I mean, there's, there's a big, obviously, political play as well. I, I, I don't think people, certain politicians in Europe, aren't happy with the fact that, um, that Google and some of the major players um, dominate the European market so much. And part of the reason they do is because there's very little joined up. There's a, an absence of harmonization uh, around the European digital uh, market. So that's why um, a lot of US and global tech companies are, are flooding into Brussels to lobby uh, and to try and influence the very important legislative plays that are, that are, that are going on at the moment and will be over the next few years. And is that a positive or a negative? Um, well, I guess it's, it's, it's positive for, for Europeans in the sense of, you know, if it boosts the economy. I think Jean-Claude Juncker has said that uh, he's the president of the European Commission. Uh, I mean, he has said that the, uh, the road, the path to European economic success is, is paid with smartphones and tablets, you know. Mm -hmm. So they have a very keen sense of the importance of the digital economy. They have a very keen sense of how much Europe is lagging behind uh, the U.S., so where my role comes into this is um, a lot of it is, is around lobbying and transparency. I mean, because you have a lot of big boys and girls now who, are, who set up offices specifically uh, to lobby the politicians and the members of the Commission and indeed the members of the European Council as well to try and um, sort of tweak the legislation or, or uh, have the legislation um, uh, created, whatever, in such a way that, that, that suits their particular market interests, which is entirely legitimate. But where I come into it is in the transparency of the process. Uh, I mean, law in, in the European Union, there is a, it's, people have a fundamental right to have that law created and enacted in public, and therefore the process of that lawmaking also has to be transparent. So if you go to Brussels, um, you'll hear a lot of chatter around um, about, about lobbying, about transparency, about access. 
about a thing called the Transparency Register, which at the moment is voluntary and whereby uh, companies register on that and then they are allowed access to, um, to some of the key players. Um, so there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of chat around that because lobbying is it's hugely important. Um, it's big business. Tens, if not hundreds of millions are now being poured into Brussels to, to, to uh, enable that. And, uh, and the tech industry is, is right up there. I think the tech industry is the, and the, the tech portfolio and the digital market portfolio is the second most uh, uh, lobbied uh, portfolio. Um, in Brussels after climate and, and energy and all of that. And what sort of challenges do you think that's going to pose for somebody like you who's trying to regulate that and be, and be, a, be a watchdog over the, over the coming years? Well, I think the, the biggest issue is, is the cultural piece. I mean, it's 28 member states and all of them have different, whatever about languages, they also have different cultural understandings of transparency, of data protection, of ethics, lobbying, all of that. So it's trying to find a common high standard and trying to persuade the Commission and the Council uh, that they have to seek a gold standard and not the lowest common denominator. I mean, for example, this Commission has brought in a lot of new lobbying rules. For, so if you want to see, let's say, if you want to have a meeting with the Commissioner or if you want to have a meeting with the Commissioner's Cabinet, or if you want to have a meeting with the most senior civil servant uh, in a particular directorate, um, then you have to sign up to the transparency register, otherwise you won't see them. But of course, a lot of lobbying takes place at a lower level, at a more junior level. Um, and so therefore, I would be encouraging the commission and indeed, well, not the council to, to sign up to the transparency register, but the commission uh, to have everybody into the loop so that everybody can have a look at, at what happens. I mean, even people today here who may have followed the progress of certain regulations or pieces of legislation will have seen that things have changed from the time the commission proposes it to the time sometimes a couple of years later that is actually voted on by the parliament. And in between has been that space for, for the lobbyists legitimately uh, to uh, try and mould the process in a way that, that suits their interest. And also, but you don't have the, 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 the other problem is that t t individual firms just don't have to lobby directly to the Commission. They can come via, via the, the individual country that they're based in. So, for example, Dublin, you have Absolutely. a number of tech giants who have their EMEA headquarters here. Quite legitimate for them to go to somebody like our, our jobs minister or our, our prime minister and say, we're not happy with this regulation. We want you to make, represent on our behalf. How, yeah. do you, how do you keep an eye on things like that, though? Well, it's difficult because one of the, 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 the council uh, is comprised of the, um, the ministers in charge of you know, various areas from the member states. So you'd have various councils for, for finance, health, education, uh, all of that. And the co-legislators are the parliament and, and the council. Um, so at the moment, the transparency register just has, the, has the, the, the commission and the parliament on, but it doesn't have the council on. But one of the most lobbied groups in Brussels would be the perm reps, as they are called in, in shorthand, or the permanent representatives, basically the EU ambassadors from the various member states. And they, of course, would be heavily lobbied because at the end, it's not just the parliament that has to vote, but the council has to agree to a particular proposal. But a lot of that is done uh, under the radar. Um, and I think that that is the most difficult piece because I can appreciate the difficulties because it's, it's around diplomacy and it's about trying to bring together, you know, 28 different member states to a single point of view and that's very difficult. And sometimes I appreciate that some of the work and that work has to be done behind closed doors. But it's finding that, that point where that level of secrecy, if you like, is legitimate in terms of the legislative process and the consultative process and, and where it's really not allowing civil society and citizen or indeed companies and business in to see what's going on. And from, a, from that individual citizen's perspective, do you think that the, the 28 member states uh, need to be more transparent themselves at, at their own level and they're actually their citizens subjected well, yeah, to no, better scrutiny. Absolutely, and if you look around the 28 member states, I mean, Ireland is actually fairly uh, advanced in relation to its freedom of information laws, its ombudsman regulation, and also it's just created a new lobbying uh, uh, register and lobbying registrar. And, and that would be not common uh, among the, the, the 28 member states. I mean, uh, in some countries, though, the lobbying register is called the anti-corruption register, so that, that also 
hotels of, of a particular cultural view of, 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 of lobbying or certain kinds of lobbying. Um, so some countries have, have a great awareness of a lobbying and, and, and how important it is to regulate it, others don't. Equally, transparency and data protection are very, diff are very different because if you take uh, Germany, for example, um, in, in, in Germany, the, the culture is very much attuned to privacy and to protecting uh, people's private uh, life, private documents and so on. And they would have a different view to how data protection would perhaps be seen in, um, in, in this country, which would be more a, a commercial issue. And of course, that doesn't mean that, that either country is better or worse at data protection. It means they're coming at it from a different historical viewpoint. So in Germany, uh, Nazi Germany, you know, the Germans have a very strong awareness of how people's personal information was used. Um, particularly with the Jews, to round them up and murder them, you know. So, so that, that has kind of left a legacy um, around the, uh, the, the private space of, of, of individuals. Um, so that, in, in one sense, uh, what I find what can be difficult for me as, as, as ombudsman in Europe is when you're trying legitimately to um, have records released to a company, an individual, an NGO or whatever, and within that record perhaps is the name of, of, a, of, a, of an official working in their official capacity, and the record isn't allowed to be released on the grounds of data protection, which I mm -hmm. think is, is, is a smokescreen. So it, it's, it's, it's weaving through those various cultures in order to arrive at an acceptable standard, acceptable in terms of the level at which it's pitched, but also acceptable, broadly speaking, culturally to the 28 member states. And I presume with, with such a growth in the lobbying industry in, in Brussels in particular now, uh, you're in demand if you're a former official with, in, in one of the, the, the key uh, European Commission uh, departments. So what's your view on that, on that issue of the revolving door? Somebody can go out the door of the, of the, the Burlamont one day and walk into a lobbying firm across the road yeah, that's a huge issue, and, and I'm actually uh, launched a, a systemic investigation in, into that um, last last year, and that that's kind of going through the process at the moment. I mean, information is is key to everything, and if you have the inside information in relation to a particular regulation, a particular play that's happening in Europe, that is going to have an impact on the bottom line of your company is going to have a very important impact on, on, on profit and loss and so on, then obviously you're going to try and get as much information as you can. And who has the most information? Well, people with the most information are the people who are working in, let's say, the, the commission in the various director generals, uh, generalists, um, the various directorates. Um, they're the ones who are proposing the legislation. Uh, they're, they're the ones who are negotiating with the council and the parliament or dealing with them as the legislative process goes on. And so, obviously, if you're a, a big tech company and there's a particular regulation coming down the line that you want to influence, if you can um, recruit uh, somebody freshly minted from, from the commission uh, who's had this as their portfolio or knows, you know, uh, a, a lot about it, then obviously that's quite a coup. It is entirely legitimate for people to move from the public sector to the private sector, but what is not legitimate is if they use then insider information for the benefit of the private company who's hiring them. So this is known as the revolving door. The Commission does have particular regulations in place and staff regulations and so on. Um, I'm not convinced that it is monitored um, adequately, um, enforced adequately, uh, and I think really the rules um, have to be tightened because I actually make a business case when I talk to commissioners about this to try and persuade them to, uh, to, to, to do this a, a bit better. I say, you wouldn't let somebody come in off the street and, and hack your computer or steal your files and walk out with them. No, you wouldn't. So equally, you cannot allow people in whose brain all of that information is stored to just go out unconditionally uh, and work for a company um, whose lifeblood is caught up in the work that your former public sector employer was doing. Finally, I, I, the clock is ticking down there. At a web summit, I, I can't let you go without asking how tech savvy you are. So what are your favorite apps? What kind of phone do you use? What kind of laptop do you have? I love Pinterest. I love um, Etsy. I'm a classic female, I know, in relation, in relation to that. But I spend more time telling my five children to get their heads out of their smartphones and their iPads and all of that than I do uh, on my own tech stuff. No, I am, I am a big tech user. Obviously, uh, news websites is, is hugely important to me. And then for relaxation, shopping and all of that, it's, it's the others. Okay, Emily Ryan, thanks very much for joining us Thank here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.